Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And, uh, Alex, I have some exciting news. Exciting news? Oh, good. Yes, and it has nothing to do with yams, so that's even better. That's unfortunate. We have gotten a, uh, a letter from one of our listeners. So what you're, what you're trying to say is, we just got a letter. It's from Blue's Clues, it's probably... Oh, so, yeah, yeah, I don't, can't, I don't can't watch a lot that. of blues, of blues or clues, but I'm so, going to Also, it's mail right. time. It's mail time. That's fine. We could have gone to uh, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Mr. McFeeny? Mr. McFeeny, Mr. thank McFeely. you. Mr. McFeeny. Whatever it was. Mr. McFeeny has come around and given us a letter in digital form. This is from Julian. Uh, thank you, Julian, for your letter. And uh, in addition to just talking about some of the general stuff that uh, Julian found interesting in our show, give us a little bit of feedback. Which we appreciate dearly, mind you. We absolutely do, and thank you very much for that. There was a a part in that letter about uh, asking for topics. We had actually put that out to our audience a a while back in what they refer to as uh, episode 202, or 200-ish. Uh, where where we had asked uh, if anybody had topics that they wanted to see us cover. And so the one that is uh, listed here, I wanted to address, and so I'll start by just reading what is written. Whilst you speak of game mechanics, we often do for the record, one of the things that has interested me is heartbreakers, hacks, and mods of existing games. Uh, I.e., where you take an existing game and rewrite a portion of the rules or change the setting for whatever reason. I have been laboriously compiling a hack for the Hero Quest board game over the past few years to bring a bit more of a roleplay aspect into the game, where your heroes can learn and grow over successive games. The topic of Heartbreakers, Hacks, and Mods is an interesting one, I think. Uh, when is a house rule only a house rule? And when does it become a hack? Why even hack a game? Why bother to mod a game? There's a lot of components to that. The first thing that actually struck me when I first saw that, too, and Alex, I don't know uh, how you feel, but when I I heard the term heartbreakers, I was like, I don't know what that is. (laughs) Yeah, I I was the same way. I was like, heartbreakers? I'm like, "Mm, not sure. Is that a game? Is that something you do actively on Saturday nights? I'm not sure. It's it's love letter, but it's it's like it's a modified love letter version. I, I had looked it up, and I I got a few different conflicting definitions, so uh, I, I think it's kind of like in and around the idea of building a system that is very much rooted in one specific system previously. And I think they usually apply it to, like, Dungeons & Dragons. Like, if you invented a system that was so close to Dungeons & Dragons that it basically breaks your heart that you've you've essentially recreated the wheel <laughs> in some ways. Pathfinder. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that there were really like specific ones that weren't even working off of like D and D specifically, but kind of ended up becoming D and D. But I feel like that's one that at some point maybe we'll get back to talk about that in more detail because I think that's like a, a whole other discussion. But let's talk a little bit about uh, about hacks and mods, yams and yams. Let's talk about yam mods. <laughs> What happens when you mod a game so it has yams? I have Dungeons and Dragons, I want to put yams in it. Can you think of any kind of, like, uh, hacks or mods to existing games uh, that that you are aware of? I mean, there's plenty of mods on the Nexus forums. Are there any one specifically that you you have played, or...? I mean, are we? We're talking tabletop, right? We're talking tabletop. We're not yeah. talking. We're, we're not. Oh, talking I was. Digital. I was talking like Skyrim and Fallout. <laughs> oh yeah, no, Skyrim and Fallout. That's that's totally a different thing. Well, I mean, if we were talking about the digital realm, and we we can briefly, because I'm, I'm pretty sure Julian is, is specifically talking about tabletop gaming. There there are points where I would say a mod is a complete recreation, like a, a completely new game from the original game. 
and then sometimes it's just a you know changing some things up in the world like oh if yeah you were to like if you were to look at like a fallout 4 for instance there are a lot of things where they'll just add aspects and and stuff into the game world but then when you see like um oh god what was the big ambitious one that they were working well cascadia and i think um miami which were basically completely new games that the modding community was building out of it. Yeah, they use the tools that the game gives them to make yeah. their own uh, places and, and whole basic game, essentially, you're right. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so those, those are, like, mods and hacks to a game, because mm. it still uses everything that that base game is built off of. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you're using it in a way that the game was not intended to be used. Uh, right. In that case, like Fallout 4 becoming Rhode Island <laughs> instead of Boston. There may be some aspects to them that look very similar, but the landscape has been completely uh, changed around. Like when I think of hack, like when I think of the, of the word hack itself, I'm mostly figuring that you're trying to break the existing rule set. Um, not necessarily break it, typically. Um, I think a lot of times when people prefer to hacking a game, mm. um, it's kind of taking chunks out here and there. Okay. Like, using the good bits, okay. not the bad bits. So you're yeah, yeah, yeah. hacking the game apart more so. Okay. I could be completely wrong. That's just what I see it as. <laughs> We're always welcome for feedback. So like if you, wanted to, if you wanted to hack D&D, you could say, well, this mechanic is kind of clunky, so I'm just going to remove it or replace it. Mm -hmm. Or say you like something a lot, and then you're like, all right, cool. Well, I'm going to add on to that, so I'm going to hack this mechanic or modify this mechanic. You've, you've run games before. And you, you've, you've worked in existing systems. Do you have some examples that you might be able to give me of places where you had to do modification to the existing game the rules in order to or make them I've work well to? for you? Where you have to. Or where oh, you've geez. been in a game where you've had to. Oh, jeez. I mean, one common example of not, nothing severe, but uh, technically uh, fudging a dice roll would be mm. kind of hacking the rules. Or right. modifying the rules. Because you're bending what the dice says to fit the story or the, the gameplay that for the outcome to be different. So despite the rules saying, you know, you do this, so you roll the dice and you read that number and it is that number. It's if you fudge it, technically you're kind of modifying that because, oh, well, I'll just add two to this even though they can't see it. You know. Oh, okay. The role yeah, I... is secret, so it's not like you're going to go, oh, I actually rolled a 17, not a 15. Right. I don't know if that's so much a hack as it is just saying that uh, I'm going to just take the, the mechanical part of that out, essentially, for the narrative portion. At the same point in time, though, if you're just going to do that anyways, mm. then what's the point of rolling the dice? Right, right. Well, see, that's what I'm thinking, though, is... If, if we're basically saying, like, technically this should be a mechanical part that we're getting into, but we're kind of just going to negate that. We're going to kind of, like, take that out. I don't necessarily know if that's a hack as much as it is just a, a decision to not use something in the game. Because I'm not replacing it with anything. I'm just, uh, I'm just removing yeah. something. On, on the flip side, you get things like homebrews. Yes. Which are pretty much hacks because you're mm -hmm. taking and making new classes mechanics rules uh all these things for an existing game system and implementing these new things you've come up with and putting them into a game that wasn't meant to support what the what your creation does i see some of the cases in this when you homebrew for instance people don't account for balance. I've seen some different character models that have been built that definitely seem like they are not balanced. Yes. <laughs> there, there's a lot of those, like the, um, what, I think Chuck Norris. Oh, well, of course. Or Sir Terry Crews. Yeah, that one. That one is, a. Uh, it's funny. Oh, yeah. It's, it's hilarious, but it is not, like, something that you would actually want to play. And if you did want to play, it would not be balanced. Or the uh, the Old Spice Gentleman class, if you remember <laughs> yes. that one, too. Yes. 
like for me, if I'm thinking about home brewing, because we can talk a little bit about home brewing in this. We can talk um, about anything we want, Nathan. We can, but I would like to address uh, what Julian's uh, discussing. But I think home brewing kind of comes into this as well. Like when I'm thinking about home brewing, in order for it to be considered like a modified system, it would be rule sets that you were putting down at the very beginning before you actually started a campaign or anything like that. If you were homebrewing as time goes on and kind of like tweaking and modifying things, that just feels like what happens normally in a role-playing experience. It doesn't really feel like you're modifying the system. You're just playing to the game, essentially. Okay. And do, do, you feel, do you feel that way or do you have a different take on it? I, I feel like most people don't take and modify the game itself as it's ongoing. That would be an interesting thing. Like maybe not D&D, maybe like games like Fate, for instance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or games that are, rely more or less on dice rolls and more heavily on the roleplay aspect and storytelling aspects could do that. Okay. But generally, I don't feel like in D&D people go, oh, well, this is a weird thing. I'm not going to use it. I'm going to make my own mechanic right now if you are interesting though i can give you some examples of modified rules that were implemented after the fact in dungeons and dragons sure nathan that would be wonderful i will actually i will cite adventure zone and i know that you haven't listened to adventure zone but i have not uh but during that particular the balance arc they were fairly new to dungeons and dragons so they start with the basic rules you know it, it becomes pretty obvious that they're just trying to wrap their heads around how the game is played at the yes. beginning. So they actually have a, um, I think it's the Minds of Fandelver is actually what they were working off of for the first part. They have that starter quest and they kind of go through that, but then they start to implement some things. Griffin starts to implement some things that are definitely outside the realm of what you would consider D&D mechanics. One of the first things was um, the the fantasy Gashapon machine, essentially, that he makes. Gashapon? It got, you know the little capsules that come down and they have little prizes in them? Is that what those are called? Apparently. Uh, when they would go uh, to, to like level up and, and visit the moon base, by the way, there was a moon base. So yeah, I, I got that. A little bit out. They would go to this machine and they would roll a, a d20. Each one of the characters essentially had a separate list that was a D20 list, and it would determine what they received for, like, a special item that they could then use for the rest of the adventure. One of the other things that they did, I think it was, like, the second arc or third arc, they had a whole extended racing part. And so what Griffin had put in at that point was a mechanic that determined the speeds of all of the vehicles that were on this track to see the that new ones are coming up and uh and other ones are you know veering off and crashing into the sides of the walls and everything and that so your turn order keeps changing based on the racers that are coming up behind you while you're on that and um and I think that he had basically modified it so that instead of individual players taking turns, it was each racing car was taking a turn. So the people that were on them were actually making those rolls together. That's so, interesting, but that's mm. more like a specific scenario. Okay. Where you would make the rule to, or the mechanic to fit the scenario that you've made for your specific game. But it's okay. not like it's something that you're going overall for the entire game. So right. Like, unless your players decide they want to race a lot, that's only going to be used like the one time. That that was just in that one particular arc. There there is something that I found very interesting at toward the end of that particular campaign that did translate over to the to the end game. And he had basically done almost a modified powered by the apocalypse system that he put in to determine based on the character choices that they made, how many, like, bonds and connections they had to the world before they get to the final conflict, and they would be able to utilize those when they get to the end game. So there's, like, this one part of that whole thing where we essentially step out of Dungeons & Dragons altogether we go to this other system, and then what happens during that arc in that system then translates back into what happens when we go back to Dungeons & Dragons at the very end. So I found that whole thing really interesting, that, we actually, that they actually stepped out of a system and then rejoined it 
and made what happened inside of that one specific arc translate over. That's interesting. Mm. Um, do you do you know if it was difficult to translate the characters and all the stuff from? Here's here's what I got because Griffin was talking a little bit about it. Is um, when they got to that particular section because it's been out for a year. I guess it doesn't really matter if I spoil too much, but I'll try to do pretty vague stuff in case you want to listen. I won't. You can be fine. But if okay. other people want to listen, that's, you know. It, it doesn't really matter if I give you the whole rundown of what happened. But basically, they were trying to determine what had happened before these characters had even started on the adventure. Like, there was, there was stuff that happened before they had even begun that they were just becoming aware of now. Like, they didn't realize that they had lost memories, and they had to figure out what happened beforehand. So, technically, everything that was being built happened before their character sheets were even made. When they got to that section, they had rolled up a few specific stats uh, that determined how good they were at certain things. But there wasn't going to be any combat. Like, that, that became pretty obvious, so most of those other mechanics were not necessary, and they were mostly focusing on getting these stats together as a storytelling exercise. What happens through that storytelling then becomes essentially bonuses that they get when we rejoin with their character sheets and all of that. So so they didn't really have to do too much to translate it. It really didn't matter too much if their strength score was this or their intelligence was this or they could do a they, their initiative was 17 or 18 because we were going through multiple scenes where they just had to make character decisions that would determine if they gained, like, uh, treasures or artifacts or anything like that that might be useful when we get to the, the final conflict now that they've been awoken, essentially. The final conflict. When you get to the final countdown, exactly. Because of that, they actually didn't have to do much translation from one system to another. So is that really a hack or a mod, then, if there's no real... Changing I don't... in the dynamics and the systems, mechanics, and the rules? See, I don't know if I would consider it a hack or a mod, except in that one specific spot. Because I would consider that more of a role-playing thing. But at the same time, I mean, they were stepping completely out of the system that they were using. For... Sort of. They just weren't using the mechanics. Oh, okay. Okay. Or were they using specific mechanics to Apocalypse World? Uh, I believe, and We're it's powered been a little, by the apocalypse. Sorry. Yeah, it's been a little while since I had listened to it, but uh, if I remember correctly, they were basically translating the fact that they had a fighter, they had a cleric, and they had a a, a mage, a wizard, and that would give them certain stats in terms of what apocalypse world provides, and they just worked off of that. That like yeah. their role would would determine essentially those basic stats that they would have but that it was mostly just to figure out what things they had done in the past that are now going to be useful for them in the here and now. Almost like they made a prequel, and like they used like an Apocalypse World, uh, a modded version of Apocalypse World, in order to do essentially the prequel story to the Dungeons & Dragons story that they were telling in the here and now. That's kind of what it is, but I don't know if I would necessarily refer to that as a, a hack or a mod. But at the same time, it does feel like they did major modification to what Dungeons and Dragons would be, if you say you're using that system. It, it, it was definitely definitely atypical of the mm. D and D, right? Set. Right. That's what I'm thinking. But I guess I guess when I think about mods myself, it is something that's supposed to be implemented into the game as a whole. Uh, so something that it. you could consider a mod could be alternate campaign settings. Um, anything okay. you get off the DM's Guild, for instance, those are mods. Okay. Because um, they are modifying certain aspects of the game. They're okay. not made by the company. They're not Wizards of the Coast like saying, hey, these are things we made. These are things other people made. And, you know, support their work. But... You know, they're legal in your game if you want them to be. So they are ways to hack and mod your game in ways that the original game didn't necessarily anticipate. But they're also ways to add a lot more different types of content to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Because technically you could use a system like D&D &D for things that are not necessarily 
fantasy or high fantasy settings. I, I thought you were going to say that aren't D&D, and I was going to be like, yeah, I use D&D in the shower. <laughs> well, you know, those dice, you can use them for, to exfoliate. You yeah, rub they, the, you rub especially the, dice. the D4s. Yeah, the D4s are great for that. Also, the thing is, is that D4s are caltrops, and they will function pretty much like caltrops if you drop them on the ground. <laughs> I mean... Newsflash, people knew that 20 years ago, Nathan. Well, there you go. That's why they're called that. Congratulations. <laughs> Nathan figured out why we called D-Force Caltrops today. Because they basically oh, function Nathan. the same. Oh, me. Um, oh, go, yams. Go, going to the... <laughs> yams! Um, so, Bulbasaur. Bulbasaur. So, to, to go back to the question, though, uh, like it says in the letter... Uh, I have been laboriously compiling a hack for the HeroQuest board game, and uh, as it explains, HeroQuest is essentially a single-game dungeon crawl. But uh, Julian has been looking to put more of a role-playing aspect into the game where your heroes can learn and grow over successive games. So that does feel like a pretty major modification to an existing thing. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Anytime you add that kind of um, intricacies to a system, mm. it changes the overall way the game is played because suddenly in this instance um what you're doing is you're taking something the game doesn't have and adding it there but it also ends up adding a lot of more depth to your characters and decision making processes here's a question and oh man people may have questions uh, may have thoughts on this but if we're if we're looking at like creating more narrative elements to something that's mostly a combat focused game, would a D and D five E be considered a modification to the original Dungeons and Dragons? I think it would be considered an update. Okay. Okay. Or a, a new edition. So okay. technically, yeah, it's a, it's essentially it comes down to yeah, I guess you could say it's the original rules very heavily modified over several editions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, technically speaking, I guess you could kind of look at that in two different respects. If you're just kind of saying, well, that original one was D&D and now the the 5E is D&D, then yeah, it does does look that way. But if you kind of take it as a completely new system because they don't really translate I mean, it, it kind it kind of is it's a new system compared yeah. to original D&D. Right, cuz you can't translate a character from from an original character sheet to a new character sheet, it just. It, I mean, you could probably take a character from, uh, you know, first edition, second edition, and bring it up to, you yeah, know, fifth edition. But it would have to be. You would heavily have to. You'd have, have to that. overhaul a lot. You'd have to uh, modify for everything that is no longer there, right? And is suddenly there. Like right. there's way more now than there was then. So actually, um, to answer uh, one of the questions, uh, why bother to mod a game? Maybe it's just time. Sometimes maybe that's the reason why you have to mod a game is because over the course of time, you find better ways to do something, uh, whether it's by the official company or not. That's not a false statement. I mean, on the topic of, the, of like Fallout and Skyrim, for instance, why mod a game? And the answer is simple. Bethesda can't finish their games. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> so like the modding community, uh, I know it's not tabletop, but the modding community there like, some of them do, like, unofficial patches, yeah. fixing broken gameplay elements and mm -hmm. things that don't make sense to better balance the game. Yep. Um, yep. Like, weapon damage or skills or stuff that doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it's, it's really nice, because you suddenly go, wow, these people took the time to take this pretty awesome game as is and make it better. Yeah. Because it functions the way it was intended to function. Or at least the way that the the view of the community thinks that this should have functioned that way. The crux of that is, hey, we like your game, but we want to improve upon it, so we're going to do it. The thing that I have seen that is a, a topic for a different time is, for the most part, they don't really ever get any compensation for the hundreds of hours that they put into that. <laughs> so, I mean, not typically from like the game companies, but... No. Uh, you can support these people, obviously. There are ways you can do that. Kind of the same way you promote podcasts. Like, if you like yep. this, share it with people. Um, upvote yeah. it, etc., etc. Yeah. Do all that stuff so that it gets endorsed. If we're talking about, like, a Fallout 4 or Skyrim, it's not something that Bethes Bethesda makes that available, but they don't actively say, hey, make our game better. 
although it is so heavily implied at this point that you feel like, like they're well, since they're still doing... using the creation engine yeah it's pretty yeah. much implied we <laughs> need you to much. fix the game until they get until nintendo gets a hold of them and says hey you have to actually you know finish a game we're gonna try and sell it on our store or until they make a game that you can't mod 76 I mean, you uh, can mod it. You just get in trouble for mod. Yeah, there's no, there's no mod support. But yeah, it, it does feel like it's so heavily implied, and the, and in some ways, it works out great. Uh, one of the reasons why a lot of companies were talking about how they actually have started to support a mod community rather than discourage it is because, you know, Skyrim's like seven years old now. Why mm -hmm. do people still play it? Mostly because of the mod. Because the mod community and whatnot have made it so that the game is able to be vastly changed depending on what you want to do to it. I think that the same basic principles can also apply in some ways to tabletop gaming. Like, for instance, like, when Julian is talking about HeroQuest, like, I'm not very familiar with HeroQuest, but the fact that we still have people that are looking to make modifications for that game keeps it relevant even now, because we might be able to look at it in another, in another light. So why bother to mod a game? I would say sometimes it's to, to keep it relevant uh, in the modern yeah, spectrum. that's a good reason. Like, why even hack a game? That was one of the other questions, is obviously Julian is, is making a hack uh, for, for HeroQuest. Um, I, I guess I would pass the question back, like, why are you doing that? <laughs> like, like, there's obviously I think, real... I think the ultimate, the easiest answer would be mm. to make it more fun. Or to make it more complex, or to make it richer in terms of, of its complexity. Monetary value? Oh. Or, no. <laughs> yes, you, you raise the value of the or, game. Here, here's an actual example I can give you. Like, okay. Um, for any of the Fantasy Flight 40k RPGs they did, mm. hacking those games, for instance, would be an, effectively way, an effective way to make the game easier to play. Because right. the games are really good, Mm -hmm. But the mechanics are really not. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's so much you can do, and it's really awesome, the level yeah. that you can go into things. Yeah. But, like, streamline it, seriously. Yes. Streamline those mechanics. I know they don't own the rights to that anymore. It's a different company that has the rights to make RPGs with that license now. Right. But, like, right. when I was playing with my friends, it was like, yeah... You can get a dodge roll against a ballistics check, so you can dodge bullets. <laughs> You're Neo! And it was like, that's, no, like, I've got a sniper rifle. This guy's not dodging the bullet. I don't care how superhuman he is, he's not dodging this bullet. But, mm -hmm. unlike, the same thing with that, is like, that system ran with opposed checks. So, for every time I swing an axe at you, you can take a dodge action. And you can try to evade that. And it made the system really heavy and clunky. So stuff like that. I do feel like you're, you're right. Like, more often than not, it's trying to simplify something that was overly complex to begin with. Well, not necessarily more often than not, but absolutely as something people will try to do to streamline mechanics that are clunky. Right. And don't work. Yeah. Or work, but just consume way more effort and time and energy to do the thing mm -hmm. than it should. Yeah. For yeah. instance, D&D &D taking one combat that takes an hour to get through. I understand, yeah, it's, it's in depth and it can be really fun, but it's like the same one hour could have been spent doing so much more than killing well, one thing. Yeah, and I remember when I was talking to Pat a, about, you know, world building and games and stuff, that one of the things that we were talking about on that episode was that um, there does seem to be a, a problem with the the expansion of time where like one one hour or so or two hours of gameplay can be spent on a combat that essentially only lasts like three minutes in game yeah but then definitely. you can spend two months in game and it's like a half hour that you work in a narrative fashion and so it feels like there's a huge disparity on the amount of time you're spending in the real world comparative to the game world <laughs> and uh, it I, is yeah 
you know, combat time and narrative time function differently in games. And so I can kind of understand why you might want to do something to modify that, or to try and streamline combat, because it's taking up a lot of time. In some ways, though, I feel like D&D itself has been doing that through every iteration. Um, to a degree, combat still takes a long time in that game. It does. I mean, even now, they've simplified it, giving you advantage, disadvantage, and things like that. They've simplified it. Yeah. Um, a lot. Yeah. But it's still time-consuming. Right. Like, again, each round takes six seconds. And it could take you, you know, 10 rounds, but those 10 rounds, you know, a minute worth of combat, it takes you, you know, 30 minutes outside of the game. I think that there is a certain point where there are, are just conceits of the system that you're using. If it's a specific thing like that, and, you know, the combat system in D&D, for instance, is a very heavy component of it, even now, even with storytelling being more focused than it has been in the past. I it feel is, but here, here's the thing about that though too yeah. is D and D doesn't have a specific system or set of guidelines for experience giving to role play. I think it's encouraged more now, just because it it does seem to be a focal it is. point. It is way more encouraged than say three point five was. But you're right. We've um, we've been discussing that before. The idea that like there really isn't an experience system, and I think even by the end of when we revisited experience, we still weren't even sure how you would implement a non combat experience system, <laughs> because um, otherwise you're in the forest just researching herbs all damn day in order right. <laughs> to get as that... much experience as you can, or scare the kids with your intimidation check with your barbarian. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So you can you can game the system regardless, I suppose. My my point on that though is I think that there is a point where if you want to modify a system so much, you're almost better just having a new system altogether. There does seem to be a certain point where you just kind of need to to scrap what you had before and have something completely new because it's just not going to what you want to build isn't just is not working in the system you're trying to modify. We could always sh ship the Theseus, the uh, entire system. Yeah, yeah, y you could, you could. I mean, if you if you uh, take all the mechanics out of a D and D system and build a new system, and then will you still have the old system and the new system? Yeah, that's the old ship of Theseus thing. The thing that I find problematic, though, with the the ship of Theseus argument on that is. At the end of the day, <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't your new ship of Theseus still just be D and D? <laughs> because your mechanics are 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 exactly the same. It, it, that's basically just saying. Well, I meant if you replace the mechanics with new mechanics, oh, not the okay. same mechanics. Then then you just have two D and DMGs. <laughs> right, and you just say it's D and D, but it's actually everything has changed. <laughs> I've heard that used in many cases when it comes to modification. Like, well, what about Ship of Theseus uh, scenario? And I have to tell you, I don't know how well that works in reference to, to RPGs. I don't think it works in reference to RPGs. No. It be, works in reference to the physical ship of objects. <laughs> yeah, in physical objects, I totally understand. You know, and the whole, um, oh God, what was the other scenario? The, my, my grandfather's bow, or whatever it was that I got from my grandfather. When is it no longer my grandfather's and it's mine? Because it's past ownership. You know, things, things um, like that. Or Generally when he gives it to you. See, that's what I would think. Because you are being gifted. But the problem is that mechanics are so much more hard uh, set than like a board. Like where you can say like a board is newer, but it's still a board, and it functions the same way. A mechanic doesn't function the same way. So you're completely changing the function of that boat in, in this particular mechanical ship of Theseus scenario that we're building. So I don't think it really works so well as an, as an argument. Um, no, probably not. The other question uh, from that letter, uh, when is a house rule only a house rule? When, it, when does it become a hack? I think the answer to that would be a house rule. Mm. It's only a house rule when it's only played in your house. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, <laughs> I, I was thinking, like, I think it becomes a hack when you actually put pen to paper and write it down as, a, like, a rule set. I, like a I think it would also set. become a hack when other people that you have used it with use it other places. Right. Like, a house rule is going to be specific to your game. And, and a hack t potentially would be beyond that. So it is possible, I could, I could imagine in that scenario too, where a house rule becomes a hack because it's so popular, 
that it takes on a life all of its own. Like, a house rule for my games, typically, is that um, when a monster dies, mm. it doesn't die, no matter when you dealt the damage to it, until its turn. Oh, okay. Okay. I never really thought about that. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Well, well, here's the thing. You have to realize that d d mm. each round is six seconds. And everybody's acting in the same six seconds. Which means if you technically initiative order, everyone gets their turn. But if you kill this monster on your turn and you go first, it should have a chance to go in combat because you're all acting simultaneously. So you stab this monster as it tries to bite you, and it may or may not bite you whether it would on its turn, but after that, it would collapse dead. See, I actually thought that there was another reason why you would do that, because if everyone's acting at the same time in combat, uh, it is also possible that other characters, not knowing that that, char- that that monster was going to die anyway from your blows, would also try to attack it, because that would be the natural thought process for them. Well, that is part of the reason that it's a house rule in my games, okay. is because... It would get to the point where it'd be like, all right, you deal 10 points of damage to that monster, and it dies on their turn. And so then the next players would focus their direction on a different monster. That monster is no longer a threat. You declared it dead. So then they can turn their focuses to other things. But if you leave it alive until it, after its turn is over, yeah. it's still a threat on the table, which means your characters and your players have to allocate the resources to deal with that. I see. So they might waste another attack, another spell on this monster Mm. because they don't know it's already dead. But that would make sense. You're you're thinking And and that's my theory on it. Yeah. And I know some people would argue with that. You go, oh, but that's not fair to your players. And then my argument to them would be, well, you don't die until your turn at the end of it or get knocked out. Mm. So it balances out both ways right you want fairness for the monsters in this scenario i do because there's so many times that players just overpower them and it's like oh it's a single monster and we can kill it we have five people in the party we're gonna kill it real quick it gives it that one extra turn of combat to deal some damage yeah and it means your party has to deal with the damage control yeah that it's still going to be a threat uh, until it's natural time that it would expire. Yeah, usually when the sword is protruding from its skull. But now, if if I've already gotten the sword into its skull, it's it, is it gonna attack me? I it, mean, it's gonna have a dying a dying bite. Okay. Technically, when it gets around to its turn, though, in a round of combat, it's it's attacking around the same time that the sword would have been going into. Yeah, so like in that case, on your turn, if we described it as you sink the sword into the beast's skull down to the hilt, for instance, dealing, you know, 15 points of damage or whatever, on the monster's turn, we could you could describe that narratively as, as you plunge your sword into this monster's skull, it makes one last desperate bite at you or swipe at you as it shrieks its last you know cry of terror (laughs) Uh, okay i guess the one thing that i would say to be devil's advocate here like for me i remember that i was down and i was into death rolls occasionally and usually that happened immediately for the games that i've played that happens like immediately when it happens Mm-hmm. Like, I, like I'm, I'm there the second that an enemy takes me down below zero hit points. I do wonder, though, if we do kind of enforce the idea that everybody's taking it in that six seconds and it's all happening simultaneously in that six-second round of combat, does initiative even matter? You know what I mean? Does it even matter who's going first, who's going second? Because everybody is going to have an action. It does. Okay. Because people have a chance to react. So say you get hit for 50 points of damage out of nowhere yeah, by someone else on their first, they have higher initiative than you. Sure. And suddenly you go, all right, well, on my turn, I'm dead. Mm -hmm. Your party can notice that, hey, he just got hit for a lot of damage. Like, it's the, oh, this thing just happened in the awareness of it. So you could have your healer, like, slap you, save you from dying. On their turn, because it's before you act, but after the monster acted. So initiative still kind of plays there. 
I can I can understand your uh, your reasoning for that as as a house rule. As far as I'm aware, that's not something that is implemented generally in D and D. Like usually, it's the monsters dead the second that they drop. Blood yeah, usually it's monsters. instantaneous, which I find really weird, given that everything takes place at the same time within six second intervals. So. Right. Like I could understand if each player's turn was six seconds they all take the same six seconds yeah then i i totally understand that uh that logic as a player it doesn't really work in my favor but as a gm i can understand why that would be something you'd want to implement for the reality of the situation to recap so uh questions julian had had uh when is a house rule only a house rule and when does it become a hack uh i think pretty much we determined when people beyond you are using it no we, we said when you're only using it at home when you're only using it at home it's a house rule <laughs> right and when it's a hack why even hack a game and why bother to mod a game i think we've covered that pretty uh well to the best of our ability at least you know sometimes it's because of time sometimes it's uh, to make the game uh easier or more streamlined um, and sometimes it's just because you want to you had like I don't know Hero Quest for instance, and and you wanted to turn it into like a, a more of a role playing game instead of a, a dungeon crawl, because you love it. Uh, sometimes you don't have to have a reason. I think you just do it because it's something that you really enjoy. You want to see a system and you want to improve upon it. You want to you want to modify it for your own edification. Uh, Alex, any other thoughts that you'd want to put out? Um, no, I think we've covered most of them hopefully we did an okay job with it hopefully we did an okay job with it and uh you know what if we didn't uh feel free to send your comments our way uh because you know i'm always happy that we get to have uh, some dialogue and i'm glad that we were able to uh to get some questions in so that we could address them and uh, of course i do want to uh, thank julian thank you uh thank you very much for your letter and uh, thank you for uh, listening to the show for all this time we appreciate it so, uh, Alex, if uh, folks wanted to find out how they could modify their Delve experience, where could they go? You could go to www.yams.com. Yeah, it has all the yams you could ask <laughs> for. Uh, you, the small ones, the large ones, the ones that are a little sweet and a little crunchy in the center. If anyone's uh, unaware of what all these yam references are from, uh, go watch Nathan's last live play. There's a super cut um, on YouTube now, so... Oh, you made a supercut? Yeah, I made a supercut. It's up it's up there now. It'll be in the uh, description of this uh episode as well yeah, in case I'll you want to see it. What, what game did you play again? I played Lovers of Ether. Nathan played a dating sim yeah. for furries. Yeah. You have to admit, it was pretty terrific, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, you and that polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> Italis- he don't need no family. They can starve. <laughs> That was the funniest thing ever. (laughs) There were so many hilarious moments. The goat girl. (laughs) Yams. She is unresponsive. I ate a whole bush for breakfast. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. How long is that super cut? Like 14 minutes? No, no. It's like an hour. There's so much good stuff. The super cut's an hour? I'm not good at super cuts. No. No, you're not. Remember, there was over, like, three hours originally. So, I mean, that's that's kind of like a A cut, not a super that's cut. A, that's, a, that's an editor's <laughs> cut, but I didn't have another <laughs> word for it. You can, uh, you can also find us on Twitter. I am at Titanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. You can also find us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, basically everywhere where there are podcasts. We're, we're somewhere there. So, oh, actually, on that note, uh, I would also like to say that uh, Julian uh, said, I download your podcast from Feedbird through a podcast aggregator where I generally get all my other podcasts. So we're on other podcast aggregators. There's a billion of them. Whatever you use, just look us up. We're, we're over there. We need to make our own. That, we, that way we can aggregate our own podcasts. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yes, we got to do that. Oh, and, uh, and also said, I generally get my videos from a YouTube. And uh, that's good, because there's also a version of this that goes up on YouTube as well. So if you want to listen to the okay. podcast over there, you can do it. I also want to just send out one real good shout-out to Patreon, our Patreon folks, our shiny-level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. Thank you for supporting the show. 
And uh, if you would also like to become a patron, you can click on the banner over at Delvcast.com. And uh, for just a whole dollar a month, you can find all the extended episodes, additional content, shows that we are currently working on. Uh, you can find it all right over there. So check that out. Uh, there's even some stuff if you are not a patron yet, so that you can look at some of the stuff we have in the works. With all that being said, I feel like we need to come up with a hack for the end of the show. What should we do? Oh, sure, just cut the entire last five minutes of dialogue and mute it. Um, oh, hey, there's an idea. That's way Pack easier. Hack away! That's real, <laughs> that's way easier to edit. I think, I think I might have to try that. So for the rest of you still listening, our hack is to go back five minutes in time on the show's bar. Mm -hmm. Just hit the mute button. Hit the mute button, and then and just, just enjoy play. the silence. Yeah. Exactly. For the remainder of it. That is good quality audio content right there. And, <laughs> and don't forget to unsubscribe. <laughs> dislike and unsubscribe. You won't regret it. So for all of us here at Delve, all 500 of us. Two and, two and change. Two well, plus. see, I modified the system so that each one of us also has uh, 249 as a bonus. So others, so, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so we okay. all count. So we both count as two hundred and fifty. So from this all outro is so long. Yeah, seriously, mute the last five minutes and call it good, guys. <laughs> this is why we said just just turn it off now. Thank you all for listening. We will see you on the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan, and I'm Alex, and uh, Alex. Good news. Yams. Yams. Also good news. Ooh, I can go into Stardew Valley and start growing some yams. Okay, so that's a couple segues out of the way. Would you want um, to start that over? No. <laughs> yeah, I will. Well, now we have to. <laughs> now you have to.